welcome to Running For Real, a global community with a shared love and curiosity for running. Together we reconnect with the reasons why we love to run and discover ways it helps us become better people. Whether it's the quiet moments of a morning run while the rest of the world still sleeps, or befriending the strangers next to you at the start line of a race. We are here to connect with others who see running as the common thread that weaves our lives together. Come join me, Tina Muir, as I talk with people from all walks of life, united by a love of running. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 376 of the Running For Real podcast. Thank you for joining me today. As always, I am excited you are here. If I saw you last week in New York, loved it. Thank you so much for joining me. If you have left a review of Becoming a Sustainable Runner, you are my fave. I really, really, really appreciate you. Uh, I've really loved these interactions with many of you over the past few weeks. So thank you so much for that. Today, I am excited to bring back a returning guest to the podcast. Um, and that is Oren J. Sofa, who was on the show before. And he was the, he's the author of Say What You Mean. And now he has a new book coming out, which is absolutely ideal for this time of our development in the world, I suppose. The book, Your Heart Was Made For This. I mean, talk about a perfect book name. Your Heart Was Made For This. It's a practical roadmap to cultivating our heart's capacity to face and transform our greatest challenges, the climate crisis, oppression, anxiety, burnout. And of course, what is going on in the world right now um, with the Gaza conflict. I really think this is a powerful book. And today we dive into that. Uh, we really talk and speak to the helplessness that we feel, the unsure nature of knowing what to say and when to say, what to do and what not to do. Um, so really, this is a very, very on point, important episode. Uh, Oren is able to provide this peace and comfort uh, in a way that hardly anyone else is able to do. And so I really encourage you to slow down, listen to this, take it in and allow Oren to guide you through this moment. Without any further ado, let's get to this episode with Oren J. Sofa. Friends, it is that time of year, the best time of year for runners. We get to enjoy the time as the weather cools, as we can get outside and make the most of working our way through the humid, hot summer, getting to the best part of the year. One thing I want to remind you though, this time of year, often runners forget to remain hydrated. We think, oh, the weather's cooling off. I don't need to think about that anymore. And that's just not true. Regardless of whether you're a heavy sweater, a light sweater, or anywhere in between, you need to make sure your electrolytes are staying well topped up because you are a runner and you are sweating. If you're not sure if you're a heavy or a light sweater, uh, definitely go use that fuel and hydration planner uh, that I will give you a link to in the show notes. It is free by Precision. You don't have to use Precision products to use it. I definitely encourage you to go check that out. But I want to remind you this time of year, we got to continue being on our hydration. It's going to help your body recover. It's typically used by athletes to stay hydrated and recover faster after intense exercise. So if you have a goal race, you don't want to let it slip out of your hands now by not taking care of your hydration when you've done so well all summer. I love the pH 1500, but you may find uh, one of the other strengths works better for you. As a friend of mine, you can use code Tina sent me to get yourself 15% off. That's code Tina sent me. And that applies to the, the hydration that applies to the gels and all the other things that I have talked about and used in my races this year. So go to precisionhydration.com and use code Tina sent me. Oren, welcome back to the Running Through podcast. I am excited to talk to you today. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to see you again. Yeah, it's been great. And um, a lot has changed. We I interviewed you three years ago. Um, <laughs> so three years, there's there's definitely been some things that have changed on, um, I'm trying to think, I actually don't know the exact date, but my daughter is, is three. So I must have just had a newborn. You have since had, you now have 
I mean, he's still considered a, a newborn, old. right? Oh, no, he's, he's one. He's already one. Yeah. He's one. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I wasn't meaning newborn. I was meaning baby. But if he's one, he's technically a toddler. So <laughs> you have a toddler. Indeed. <laughs> and we've obviously had some other major things going on in our world that have thrown everyone off. And also, um, you know, we are going to talk about some of the concepts and um, just about your book, Your Heart Was Made for This, which I really enjoyed reading and feel like mm. is a very needed book at this time right now of, um, you know, there's, there's so much pain and suffering in every sense of the word world in the word right now in the world. And, um, this book, you know, gives us the tools to be able to work through it and feel like we can work through it. Mm. Um, and so I do want to talk about that, um, and, and kind of go into this face the way that we're feeling because, yeah. Particularly with the complication of what is happening in our world right now, it is easy to bury our heads, pretend that nothing, pretend for those of us who have the privilege to bury our heads um, and pretend that, you know, we, we just don't want to address this. So first thoughts for you in terms of when I say all this, um, what would you like to start with in terms of beginning this conversation about just the traumatic and devastating, heartbreaking, upsetting time we're going through right now. Mm. Yeah. Well, thanks for being so direct and real about it. Um, as we're recording this, it's, uh, about a week and a half after, um, the horrific attacks mm. of Hamas on Israeli civilians and the, uh, ensuing war in Gaza. Um, along with so much other violence happening in the world, uh, the Ukraine war, six mm -hmm. months of war in Sudan, earthquakes in Afghanistan. So, you know, who, who knows where we'll be in mm -hmm. six weeks after mm -hmm. the episode's released. But um, I think where to begin as the mindfulness adage goes, start where you are, right? And this is one of the things that I I stress in the book is to make space for whatever is true for us, wherever we are. And the reality that for some, if not many of us, sometimes the very painful realities of our world are too much, particularly if for those who suffer from trauma or PTSD. And I certainly mm -hmm. know many people whose PTSD has been severely stimulated by the outbreak of war in the Middle East. And so there's a need, I think, to honor the truth of our experience and to find balance with what's happening. And um, for me, that means sometimes turning away. And there's a key difference between turning away, as you said, when we have the privilege to, to recover and find balance with the intention of coming back, there's a difference between that and avoidance, mm -hmm. ignoring or pretending that everything's okay. Just as there's a difference between being realistic about our sphere of influence and focusing our efforts on things we can affect to make the world a better place. And throwing our hands up in the air and saying, well, there's nothing I can do, so I'm just going to focus on my family and what I can do. Those can sound similar, but they're coming from a very different place inside. Mm -hmm. And I think the results will be different based on that. So for me, those are some of the places to start, being honest with what's happening, finding balance, and being realistic about what we can and can't affect, but still making the effort to engage in the things that we care about. Yeah. You mentioned at the beginning of what you said there about, you know, some of the examples of what have, has been happening. Um, and obviously before this, we had the global pandemic and, and just the, we're still mm -hmm. coming out the other side of the damage that was done in, in every sense of that, uh, you know, physical, emotional, spiritual, um, of that. And, yeah. um, uh, it can start to feel like our world is unraveling. Um, and for me, mm. I feel like that is kind of the, you said about like being where you're at and the facing, you know, what, what is real for you. Um, 
that's where my mind starts to go of like, this is, this must be the beginning of the end. This must be where mm. we, our society is breaking down. Things are breaking down um, there. And I'm sure you have this and I'd be curious with your son. There's that part of me, the survival side of me. That's like, screw everyone else. I, I, I my, my children, that's all I need to care about. <laughs> like I, I need to protect them. Blah, blah, blah. And for then there's that piece of me that also knows that the only way, yeah. We as humanity are going to work through this is not thinking in that way and right. um, only looking after ourselves and our family. And I envision, you know, 50 years down the road, I do think there's going to be water shortages everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I envision, you know, I, I sometimes find myself daydreaming of like, well, what if I got like a, a water collector, a rain barrel collector, then at least I could give my family water and, and, and I know mm -hmm. we'd be okay. But then I'm like, stop it, Tina. Like mm -hmm. that is the kind of thinking that has got us into this mess is mm -hmm. that it doesn't matter about anyone else. It's just me. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but it's, it's hard to not jump into that mode. Um, like yeah. you said, when you do feel helpless or you feel like your voice doesn't matter or you feel like, um, there's too much for me to address. And it could yeah. easily, as you said, about turning away, like it can suck you into a pit of despair Yeah, if you're not careful. Yeah. Yeah. I so appreciate the honesty with which you're sharing. I, I can certainly relate and I'm guessing, you know, many folks can. Um, yeah. There's a few things that come to mind for me, mm. Gina. Mm. So one is the importance of taking a balanced view of where we are. Mm. And I think a lot of what we see in the world today in the media and the dominant narratives presented there are either or. There are those who argue that we have never been better as a human species and look at the amazing progress we've made and things are better. And there's some truth <laughs> to that, but it's not the whole picture. And then there are those on the other side who, who say we need, everything's crumbling. We need to prepare for the apocalypse. Mm. The world is going to, you know what, and there's some truth to that, but it's mm -hmm. not the whole picture. Mm -hmm. And, and I notice in myself, and I wonder if this is true for you in terms of what you were just saying, the presence of fear and how fear will drive us into this way of trying to understand things in a binary yeah fashion, trying to simplify that, which is actually complex. So one is trying to take a balanced view and two is being honest and making space for the fear that's there. Alongside that, when we do that, when we honor the complexity, when we honor our fear, then I think we can begin to remember that the future is not written. Mm. And that we create the future by what we do today. And so I think that it's important for each of us to look at what are the choices we're making today and how are those informed by our values and our reactions. So to take the water issue, ignoring it and pretending everything's okay, probably not so wise, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Uh, hoarding for one's family, also not going to re lead to real security, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But if water is the issue we care about, what would it be like to begin to have conversations, begin to raise awareness, to develop an action plan as a community, to invest in water storage and capture, not for oneself, but for mm -hmm. one's community, right? Mm -hmm. So we start to think in a different way when we're able to make space for and honor the truth of all of our experience, instead of feeling like we need to have the answer or need to simplify things that aren't simple. Yes. You, uh, you, when you were talking about, um, I can't remember if you said, um, you said something, you may, it may have been 
what I'm about to say, but it may have been something I can't remember exactly what it was. But you reminded me of one of my favorite things that you wrote, and that was in the introduction in your heart was made for this. Um, our actions, if you don't mind me reading, please. <laughs> um, our action uh, and our actions matter individually and collectively. Every action plants a seed. Some seeds bear fruit in this lifetime, while others lie dormant for generations. We harvest the fruit of our ancestors' actions for good and for ill, and our choices today shape the future. So you were talking about choices. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Um, that really spoke to me. I, I love that um, quote about, uh, you know, um, oh, now I can't remember it, uh, about um, planting seeds under which the tree, uh, the shade you do not, you will not be around to sit under. I really should mm. remember that quote. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Uh, but this reminded me of that, but also is very relevant to this, right? Of um, we are the, you know, the harvest, the fruit of our ancestors' actions. A lot of that was what we just, what you were just saying about individual choices, me and my family and what I need, um, not thinking about the collective um, and how we handle things today is going to affect, you know, like our children growing up, how mm -hmm. they are able to respond and what they are able to do um, within, you know, their own crises, whatever those may be at the time. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. I and that. I think it's important to recognize that thinking about the collective is not just an idealistic, compassionate response. Mm. It's actually a kind of enlightened self-interest. Yeah. Because we recognize that our fate is tied to one another. What use is it for one family to have water if the whole community is in a drought? How long is that water going to last? <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, if people don't have water, they're going to do what they need to get water. So um, looking out for one another and mm -hmm. uh, building what, what are known as mutual aid networks where we work together to meet our needs collectively, it's not just idealistic compassion. It's actually mm -hmm. wise self-interest. It's recognizing that my security is tied to the well-being and the security of those around me. The more I work for that together, the more secure we can all be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this this metaphor of seeds, uh, you know, it, it shows up in religious traditions around the world, right? The the New Testament, as you sow, so shall you reap. Uh, the philosophy that I'm drawing from in terms of my training is the Buddhist uh, Buddhist one, which talks about uh, our actions as seeds, and in particular, the different qualities or capacities that we have in our own heart and mind as these powerful seeds that we water with our attention. So we have seeds in our heart of generosity, of kindness, of wisdom, of patience, of joy. And we have seeds of fear, of hatred, of anger, of jealousy. And so the question is, as we move through our days, as we make choices, not only with our actions, but more fundamentally with our attention. What seeds are we watering in consciousness? How are we shaping our inner life, which then determines the flow of our outer life? And so the book is really designed to give people the tools to water the healthy seeds mm -hmm. so that we can live a more meaningful life and contribute more effectively to the crises yeah. that we're going through. Thank you to Tracksmith for all your support with everything that I am doing with Running For Real and beyond. I am so thankful for this relationship that I have with this brand. And I do call it a relationship intentionally. If you have seen about my book event that I hosted in Boston uh, just recently, you will see that I called this a relationship. It is not transactional. It is not you do this, I'll do this. We have a, a friendship, we're besties, and there is with good reason, because I believe in all that Tracksmith is giving to our community to make our world better. They do so many different things within the community to show support, to put their money where their mouth is and care, because now we want to find brands that care about our world and want to make the world a better place. And Tracksmith is that company. In addition, of course, to making incredibly high quality products that are long lasting. And that is one of the biggest things we can do if you want to make changes to be environmentally conscious is to get quality items that last a long time and can handle the, the toughness of the way that we as runners treat our clothes. I want to just tell you about a few of my favorite items. The Lane 5 shorts are my favorite shorts. 
I I know I always talked about the session speed shorts. I think I've shifted to the lane five. They have five pockets. They are perfect for marathon racing or ultra racing. Uh, One of those is a zip pockets. The others are perfect for gels. Uh, They sit nicely. They do not ride up and they are just very comfortable. So those lane five shorts, I am really enjoying. We are also just about stepping into the stage where my fave item of all time with Tracksmith, the Brighton base layer is just coming into its own. This is the number one product I recommend for people who are new to Tracksmith, the Brighton base layer. It is ideal for fall, ideal for winter, ideal for just taking with you anywhere. I do take it on most trips that I go on. So as a friend of mine, if you have never used Tracksmith before, you can use code Tina new to get yourself $15 off your order at $75 or more. If you are a current Tracksmith uh, customer, you can use code Tina give, and that will give you free shipping and you will make a donation to track girls uh, on behalf of uh, yourself to show your support. So thank you so much to Tracksmith for sponsoring this episode, for supporting me. I encourage you to go check it out at tracksmith.com forward slash Tina. Yeah, and and I think this is a good time to bring up the way you have uh, laid out the book in, you know, those qualities uh, that you, you know, you mentioned that you, this is one of the main reasons or this is one of the key reasons this is book is helpful right now is, is focusing on those uh, qualities that can help us. I mean, uh, just a few, and I'm curious, actually, side question here. I, I've picked out a few. Do you think the ones that people are drawn to, the ones that I'm going to say, are things that are very present in my mind because they're the ones I chose to note down? Is it like a, some kind of psychological experiment here. These, <laughs> these are where my energy is focused. Who knows? Um, so. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to say. <laughs> I mean, no, knowing myself, I think this is very these this, these. I'm not surprised I picked these ones. Um, attention, aspiration, concentration, curiosity, ease, joy, play, contentment, and my favorite, but also not so favorite, equanimity. Mm. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. What, which is one I definitely struggle with. Uh, which of those? Okay. So firstly, let's, let's explain. So you, you, you shared about the qualities, each chapter is a quality. And with each of those, you had kind of about that quality, you had a reflection, a meditation and an action, as Mm. well as if you have difficulties, why break the book down in this way? The book is meant to be a companion. It's not the kind of book that you sit down and read from cover Mm. to cover, Mm -hmm. you know, in a weekend or a week. The idea is that there are 26 chapters because if you take two weeks per chapter, you have a whole year of exploration. And so it's meant to guide us on a day-to-day and a week-to-week basis. The chapters are structured in a way that supports that. So I think there's a lot of misconceptions about many of these qualities. And I talk about that in each chapter, trying to define in a more nuanced way, for example, what do we mean by equanimity? How how that's distinct from not caring or indifference, how uh, patience doesn't mean being passive, Mm -hmm. how patience doesn't mean accepting things that are morally repugnant or unjust. So there's a need to, or I'll put it this way, I'm trying to invite people into a conversation that explores at a deeper level what these qualities mean, and then to provide practical guidance for how do we notice this in our life? Where is it present and how do we build on it? And what, how do we handle the challenges that come up? And so at the end, these sections of reflection, meditation, action, and if you have difficulties, are designed to provide a little bit of a menu. You know, do we want to contemplate the quality? Are we drawn to meditation? How do we embody it in our lives? And what do we do when we hit a roadblock or when things don't make sense or when we struggle? The other thing about the book that uh, I hope people will feel empowered to do is to skip around. Mm. I encourage people to read the first part because it lays down some foundational qualities like mindfulness and concentration and wisdom, aspiration, attention, these things that really guide us throughout the whole journey. 
Um, but I think there's a lot of value in listening to oneself and considering what do I need right now? Where do I want to focus? Is it gratitude? Is it joy? Uh, is it resolve and determination? Mm. Is it ease or rest? Or is it uh, energy and curiosity? So using the book as a companion to support us through the changes and the challenges of our lives personally and collectively. Mm. Which of those is uh, is very prominent in your life right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a few. Uh, raising a toddler, patience mm -hmm. is a huge one <laughs> on a daily basis. Uh -huh. Patience, um, compassion has really come yeah. to the fore, both, um, for some of the individual emotional and psychological material that has come up for me with this change in my life of being a father and uh, having a family and needing to engage in a deeper way with some of the core patterning and wounds that I carry. So having compassion for myself, mm. being tender with myself for places that I'm still healing. Um, and then also feeling compassion for the immense suffering in our world, and in particular um, for those who are caught in the throes of trauma and anger and revenge mm. and unable in the present circumstances or moments to move beyond that, working to extend my heart to comp with compassion to include everyone not yeah. just the people who share my views. Yep. Yeah, it's uh so I, I'll be interested to hear your thoughts with um I really struggle uh, it's a slightly off topic, but I really struggle with with my kids. Uh now I have a, a three year old and a five year old. So my five year old mm -hmm. is fully immersed in the school system. And there's very much a narrative of uh he's the bad guy. They're the bad guy. They are mm. the, you know, they're the evil one. Um, and I really struggle with that because, um, you know, the choices that people make are in some ways not their choices. It's, it's you know, things that have been hardwired. It's, it's traumatic. It's things that it's pain and suffering in their own way. Um, and with these movies that the kid, that my kids watch, but also within the narrative that they take in that there's good people and bad people, um, mm -hmm. granted, you mm -hmm. know, you know, some of the events that have been unfolding have been truly horrific and it is hard to even get to that place, mm -hmm. um, to feel understanding and forgiveness and yeah, um, yeah. for those people. However, uh, that that narrative, I, I really kind of write against it and say, you know, because someone's making bad choices doesn't mean they can't make a good choice in the future. Doesn't mean they're written off forever as just a bad person. Yeah. Um, but I yeah. will say it's really testing me right now of seeing yeah. these things and and being able to hold that. Um, yeah, how beautiful yeah. that you that you have this perspective and value for your family and your children to stay connected to the humanity of others. Mm -hmm. I think just holding that value and having that perspective in and of itself is such a gift because not everyone does. Mm. Many parents mm. choose to reinforce those narratives that there are such a thing as, you know, an evil person and a bad person. And I, I don't want to take a metaphysical stance on that. I, I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but, but what I, what I do know is that when we conflate someone's humanity with their actions, mm -hmm. 
we feel we end up dehumanizing and fueling violence, which is what I hear, the concern in your heart. The challenge, of course, is whether we are engaging with a five-year-old <laughs> mm. who is trying to make sense of the world yeah. or engaging with um, a family member who lost a parent, a sibling, a child to sure. a terrorist attack or yeah. war who is consumed with grief and anger and rage and mm. revenge. Mm. It doesn't help to say yeah a person is not just their choices yeah you know i, I think it's yeah. important to, for me at least to my view is that even as and I, i'm curious if you would agree even as our choices are shaped by our life experiences and our history and social factors that we are each ultimately responsible for our mm -hmm. choices mm -hmm. we bear yeah. we bear that responsibility mm -hmm. So for me, what I wonder is, again, whether we're engaging with someone who's five or someone who's 35 or 55, what's it like to empathize with that narrative rather than to try to change it? Mm, so with a true. child to say, you know, you seem really angry about the bad things that person did. I'm guessing you want to make sure that everybody is safe and that they don't do that again. Mm. Right. What are the needs behind that narrative? What is what is it that your your child is tr grappling with and trying to understand when people do things that are harmful? Mm. How do we relate and how do we return to a place of safety? Yeah, it's only my 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 firm belief, uh, which is coming out of. Buddhist practice, nonviolence uh, training, is that it's only by empathizing and understanding the very real fears and pain of others that there's a possibility of shifting into a different way of being together. The dehumanization piece of this uh in every sense of it in terms of the the people who you know the people who are causing pain with their you know actions their their choices uh the people who um are kind of pitting this as an us versus them pick a side um how do you navigate that piece of it in terms of looking at dehumanization and the role that it has played in us ending up in this situation, not just, you know, with, um, what's going on in, in, uh, with, you know, the, the Palestine, um, Israeli, uh, war conflict that is going on right now, but just in general, um, how do you navigate the dehumanization element of this? Mm. <laughs> don't know if I do it well or not. Mm. Um, I certainly struggle to make sense of and humanize the actions of, for example, the Hamas militants. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's not something that I, um, it's easier, for example, to stay connected to the humanity of the Palestinian civilians that are suffering in yep. the, the war on Gaza, yep. uh, for me at least. Um, I think if I'm honest, it, it's a struggle and mm. I, I want to be in that struggle because it's how I maintain my own humanity. Mm. That's what it's about for me is as soon as I discount another person's humanity, I lose a piece of my own humanity. Yeah. And so I willingly engage in that struggle in order to find some ground of dignity and possibility. Yeah in my own heart. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's the best any of us can do in some ways. Thank you to AG1 for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. I have been using AG1 for, well, since 2019, which is coming up on four years now, and it's going to give you those essential nutrients for long-lasting benefits. I have been using this for many years, and especially right now with a book tour, with all these things I have going on in my life, my AG1 has been a critical piece of taking care of my gut health, giving me focus and energy to help me with healthy aging and my immune health. I love that it is one scoop in uh, some water every morning. It is the first thing I do that's going to give me 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, and whole food source nutrients. It's that comprehensive nutrition in one simple scoop. Uh, It is a ritual that I have every morning. I wake up, that's the first thing I do, and I know that it takes care of me. So it's so much more than just taking greens, as you might hear other things talk about. It's going to give you that comprehensive blend of core health products that are going to work together to fill in your gaps. So for me right now, with two young kids and this hectic schedule, I am missing out on some nutrients, and this is where I know I'm taking care of myself in that way. So as a friend of mine, you can get a one-year free supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 by going to drinkag1.com forward slash Tina. That's drinkag1.com forward slash Tina. It is going to make it so that you have one thing to take. It will take care of you. It'll be there for you. You can take it on the go. We're going to give you that five free travel packs when you go to drinkag1.com forward slash Tina. I've been loving it for years. And those of you who um, have been signed up for a while would have seen that you've got a goodie recently. Anyone who was uh, an AG1 user when my book came out will know that you got a copy of the book as a gift from AG1 and that just speaks to the kind of people they are. They care, they care about you, they care about me and they care about the world. So go check it out at drinkag1.com forward slash Tina. What do you do to when you are feeling just, you know, one of those experiences we talked about earlier, the, the hopelessness, uh, mm-hmm. fear, overwhelm, um, mm-hmm. you know, you've meditation teacher, maybe that's just the kind of the go-to. Um, you've also, I know you're, you know, like to get outdoors. Um, what are some things that you do within those moments to calm your system, to ground yourself, to yeah. pull yourself back to the present? Yeah. Thanks. Love that question. <laughs> it's so relevant. Um, Many things and many things that are in the book. Um, (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I'll give a couple of examples, uh, both personal and collective. So um, as I talk about in the book, my father passed away very suddenly earlier this year in the final Mm -hmm. stages of editing the book. And um, our son was about five months old or so when that happened. Mm -hmm. And the first month was excruciatingly difficult and we had a five-month-old who was just a fountain of joy Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i opened myself to that joy in the present moment Mm -hmm. even amidst the immense grief I was feeling, I was shattered. He died a week before he was going to come and visit Mm -hmm. and meet Mm -hmm. his grandson. Mm -hmm. It was too much to bear. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the essential tools that we have for fear and grief and overwhelm is joy, is beauty, is noticing the remarkable gift of being alive and cultivating gratitude and joy and uh, well-being inside, not as a way of erasing or pretending or trying to bypass the pain, but actually as a way of honoring it because it's all part of our heart. And the more we make space for the beautiful things, the more fully we can grieve. And the more deeply we grieve and open to our sorrow, the more fully we can embrace life and know Mm -hmm. joy. Mm-hmm. So this is one of one of the tools, one of the ways that I work with those kinds of places we all hit of 
going down <laughs> into mm -hmm. a hole mm -hmm. uh, is recollecting and really savoring the gifts of being alive, whether it's as something as simple as drinking a sip of clean water or taking a breath of fresh air, um, or something as intimate and profound as looking into the eyes of our lover or holding the hand of our child. Mm -hmm. Now, on a collective level, I use my attention, I try to use my attention wisely, and this is why the first chapter in the book is attention, is because our attention is a commodity yep. today. Yep. And it's one of our most powerful resources. So do we allow our attention to be captivated, directed, and shaped by the media, mm -hmm. by social media, um, even by the conversations we have with others in our life? Or are we able to sit in the driver's seat and choose wisely where we place our attention? So what do I mean by this? Well, for one, after war broke, after the, the terrorist attacks in Israel on yep. Simchat Torah and then the war in Gaza, I was looking at the news before bed. <laughs> and then, of mm. course, being unable to sleep. Mm -hmm. So just on the most fundamental level, practicing <laughs> wise self-care yeah. and making choices about when we take in things like the news. This is just kind of fundamental. But then also looking at where are we getting our news from? Are, are we trying to get different perspectives, to see outside of our bubble, to widen our view? Mm. And then even more broadly... One of the things that I've been practicing, and this is this is essential for those who either are aligned with or curious about uh, principled nonviolence as an approach to social change, where are we placing our attention in terms of what's happening in the world? It's essential to not look away from the suffering as we started our conversation with, but it's also essential to not ignore or overlook all of those who are clamoring for peace and change mm -hmm. and being creative about how to do that. So I, I take refuge in the voices of family members whose sons, grandparents, spouses were murdered by Hamas who are calling out for peace, saying, yeah. not in my name. Yep. Do not seek revenge in my name. We need yep. a different way forward. I take refuge in the millions of people around the world who are calling for sanity and restraint and saying, stop, we have to end this violence, no more bloodshed. It's easy to overlook that because the media doesn't report on it, or if they do, they skew it. Yeah. So using our attention is this incredible resource that we have, whether it's about how are, what are we taking in and where are we placing our attention, or what qualities are we cultivating? Yeah. As I started with, are we paying attention to joy, to gratitude, to taking time for rest and self-care? Are you good at doing those things? The rest, self-care? Mm. <laughs> I'm getting Turning better. Away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting better at it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I have a lot of conditioning to, uh, mm. uh, to overwork, mm. you know, sort of my mm. personality is conditioned to, contribute through doing to get mm. love by giving mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> you know so my my default when i'm not paying attention or if i'm stressed will be to go into doing more but having a toddler <laughs> yeah. um, and having a, an amazing wife uh, is a huge support to calling me back to another way of being so i i am getting better at it and uh yeah, I think it's a it's a work in progress always that balance of self care. Yeah, it's one, it's one that's joyful. It's mm. one that's joyful because the results are uh, are nourishing. Mm -hmm. I want to share something uh, that I experienced yesterday, which was a big win for me in that in that area. I um I very much yeah fall into the doing mindset, um, constant like moving of the goalposts. Uh, mm. Struggle to with. Um, you know, pulling back, uh, 
removing myself, getting to the point where a few weeks ago I was at um, a marathon working an event and I do a lot in, I, I don't know what you do and don't know with this, but I do a lot of like sustainability work for uh, marathons. And mm-hmm. I just reached a point where I had pushed too hard for too long and I just broke. I was mm-hmm. just emotional and I couldn't pull myself out of this hole I found myself in. And so I recognized, okay, like I've got to, I got to, I got to pull back. And I did. Um, but then this week again, got back into the mindset of, okay, get back on, get back on the doing. Mm. Um, and I also have my history of exercise where I, you know, exercise every day, form a professional athlete, hard to break that. But yesterday I was supposed to, not supposed to, I <laughs> had the option of doing some kind of exercise, like a bike ride or something. And I just didn't feel like it. And I felt like I wanted to be outside but I didn't want to go on a bike ride. It was a beautiful day, quote unquote, should be the perfect time to go out and exercise. But I instead went over to um, visit a friend um, who passed away this year uh, in the cemetery. And I sat and talked to him and told him about, Mm. you know, what I was feeling, what I was seeing, talked to him about, and just there was trees of every color all around me. And I just sat there for, mm. I don't know, 30, 40 minutes and just mm. was still and, and unplugged and like sitting on the, on dirt essentially. Like he, he, he passed away about six months ago. So the ground is, you know, there's no, um, yeah. stone there or anything. And yeah. I felt so good after that. It was worth skipping the exercise. It was worth the hour of work I, or hour and a half of work I lost. Yeah. Um, and it was just such a good like reset for me in terms of being out in nature, finding that joy and just simply sitting outside on a beautiful day, talking mm. to my friend who is no longer here, which obviously brings up grief and sadness. Yeah. But yeah, I, it really was just such a powerful reminder to me of mm. how easy it could have been to push that aside and say, oh, I'll go there another day. Mm. Um, I'm supposed to exercise or I should exercise and I mm. didn't. So yeah, that thank was you for sharing. <laughs> yeah. I'm so sorry to hear. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And what a lovely different experience you mm. gave yourself mm-hmm. for me when I have moments like that, I try to do what you're doing now, which is to reflect on and really savor Mm. difference as a way of reinforcing a new pattern, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Of kind of solidifying, I can make different choices and these are the results. Mm -hmm. And for those listening, I think it's also important to remember that it doesn't need to be an hour and a half, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, Mm -hmm. I, one of my practices these days is before I start my work day is to do a little bit of stretching, meditation, self-care to resist the impulse to just dive in, Mm. you know, and to really make it practical, like it doesn't need to be half an hour. What if it were just five minutes and, and to see the difference it makes? Okay. I have to, I've been, this is a question I've wanted to ask you since the very beginning. I, when I saw you, you, you know, had a a new baby boy, you had a son, my mind immediately jumped to, okay, he's going to get it now. Because I, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, went through so many years where I was doing such a good job with not like a long meditation, a, you know, five to 15 minutes a day. And then when my kids came around, it felt like anytime I literally sat down ready to do it, they would appear. Um, they would wake up. Even if I woke up early, they would you know, be playing happily. And as soon as I sat down, it was like they could sense it. Mm. And so I, for me, found that I got so, and again, you know, you're going to, this is going to speak to the piece of you that's like, you're expecting perfection from your, you're expecting an outcome from your meditation. Um, And that's where for me, I find like the going outside, putting my feet in the grass, grounding myself by putting my hand on a tree bark or something. I find that for me centers me at this stage of my life, Mm. but how did you struggle at any point with, you know, you've had this piece of you that's such a big part of you, but your son doesn't care if you're trying to meditate. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, how have you navigated that piece of it? Yeah. Well, initially I just let go of any, 
<laughs> expectations, expectations <laughs> yeah. or attempt of trying to have uh, some kind of regular formal meditation uh-huh. practice because it wasn't possible. It wasn't possible, mm-hmm. you know, but, and today I have the good fortune of, you know, we ha- pay for a nanny because mm-hmm. we both work mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. uh, We take turns taking care of him. So, you know, I do have time where it is my own and I can make my own choices. But the two things that have been a saving grace for me, one is just having the good fortune of having started my meditation practice so early in my life. And then the random circumstance of having a child later in life. Mm gave me a couple of decades (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and then some to really strengthen my own capacities for presence Mm -hmm. and to train myself in staying present during activities and in making the most of short moments. So when our son came along, it wasn't unusual or unfamiliar to practice being mindful and meditating while walking him up and down the living room, while changing Mm -hmm. a diaper, while Mm -hmm. washing dishes, while lying down to go to sleep, because I'd been doing all of that in different ways for more than 20 years. Mm -hmm. So my, my childcare became my meditation. You know, and still is watching him play or engaging with him. I'm practicing presence, mindfulness, curiosity. Uh, and then also, as I said, being able to make the most of small moments. Mm-hmm. So whether it's just taking a breath or sitting up on my pillow before bed, uh, exhausted at the end of the day and just meditating for a few minutes and coming mm-hmm. back to my body and my heart and allowing the challenges or difficulties of the day to sort themselves out Um, when our life circumstances don't afford us the opportunity to meditate for a longer period of time there's still ways that we can cultivate awareness and find balance and process the things that are in our heart Mm -hmm. it does take skill and it does take time and it does take effort um, and and that's why I wrote this book is to try to provide not just one tool like, okay, meditate, <laughs> but many tools. Like mm. here are so many ways. And this is one of the things that I think is kind of lost in the popular perspective on mindfulness is that mindfulness is just one quality. It's an important one, but it's only one aspect of a much, much richer, broader field of contemplative practice, Mm. which involves recognizing that we have the capacity to shape our inner life and taking an active role in that through art, through music, through ritual, Mm. through relationship, through contemplation, through nature, through celebration, there's all of these different ways to engage with and nourish ourself and our inner life. And that's really what I'm trying to uh, introduce into the conversation is a much broader palette to choose from. Yes. Yeah. And I really appreciate that piece because I think that would have been or is a question that maybe many people listening might be wondering, okay, how do I, how do I know what that is for me? How do I find what, what is going to you know, speak to me at this point in my life. And, and as you said, you've given many different examples, many different ways, actions to do. Uh, I do want to speak to the piece of even myself in reading this, when it came mm-hmm. to the action pieces, mm-hmm. there was that piece of me that was like, I, I just want to do the reading. That is probably that tied to the, uh, what you were mm-hmm. saying, doing, right. Mm-hmm, I want to check mm-hmm. this book off my list. I want to mm-hmm. check this chapter off. I'll, I'll do the action things. I'll come back to that another time. <laughs> right. So can you speak to that? Cause I, I suspect that's quite a common when a book has you, you know, my book also has action steps at the end of the chapter. Mm-hmm. Um, I suspect that's quite a common thing for people is I'll come back to that yeah, um, yeah. because it requires Thanks. work. So right. yeah, what yeah. would you say there? Well, first I just appreciate the question and yeah, how transparent and, and 
practical you're being. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, I, I think there are two things, um, or let's see, let's say there are three things. So the first is that they're invitations, mm-hmm. right? They're not obligations. There's no homework. <laughs> <laughs> so they're invitations. And, and the idea is to go on a journey through the book and to choose. It's like, you know, when you're, you've had the opportunity to be a tourist someplace new, and there's things to see and do, and you might not do all of them, but you'll do some of them. Mm-hmm. And it's like that. It's like, you know, do I want to go to the lookout or to the museum? <laughs> it's like you choose what you want to do. So they're invitations. That's the first thing. The second thing is when I hear that sense of, oh God, <laughs> not another thing to do. <laughs> that uh-huh. says that we need rest. Oh. That says mm. that we need ease. Mm. That says that we need pleasure. <laughs> and so I would encourage you and anyone who's finding that kind of resistance to exploring actions to focus on the chapters that are designed to really nourish our hearts Mm. because the action, I want it to be something that we engage in willingly, if not joyfully. Yep. So I would start there. I would start there and really spend as long as you need there nourishing yourself until you feel some interest and energy to go into other areas. The last thing I'll say is that the most fundamental action for any of the chapters and any of the qualities that I am uh, presenting for us to explore and cultivate is simply to pay attention to it. Mm. So whether we're talking about uh, empathy, courage, wonder, integrity, contentment, concentration, the most basic way of engaging with the quality and cultivating it through action is through the action of where we place our attention, the mental action of, can I notice the presence and the absence of this quality during my days? that in and of itself Mm. will begin to water its seeds. I needed to hear that. Um, (laughs) (laughs) As we start to wrap up here, what would you like to remind people to take with them? I mean, obviously we would love them to take a, a read of this, uh, to help them, if if any pieces of this have spoken to them, uh, to the listeners, in terms of dealing with just kind of this inner struggle that we are facing, the anxiety mm. about this time period. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mentioned to you about environmental, like the climate yeah. crisis is another looming thing mm-hmm. that is on our shoulders. Mm-hmm. Uh, what would you like to just invite people to think about, do? Sure. Consider, remember yeah. as they move forward. Hmm. I think the first is that every day we are practicing something mm-hmm. with how we live, how we use our attention, the things we think, say, and do. And if we are intentional about that, every day we can grow stronger more resilient, more kind, loving, and flexible. This is an incredibly, hopefully, empowering message that we can shape our life Mm -hmm. and position ourselves to be as resilient as possible in the face of so much change and challenge and hardship. This is the first thing. The second thing I would want to leave people with is that we don't have to choose between self-care and social change. And that in fact, my personal view, and there is a whole long tradition of spiritual activism and socially engaged Buddhism that says that these two are actually deeply intertwined and depend upon each other. That if we are not engaging in self-care and some form of 
uh, of kind of a contemplative or spiritual or inner exploration, our social change work will be limited at best um, and uh, counterproductive at worst. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the reverse is true. Um, if we are only focusing on self-care and spiritual cultivation, we are cutting ourselves off from certain responsibility and, and depth of fulfillment in our human life by not engaging with the broader context that we live in. Mm, so good. One more like follow-up question from that, that I, with what we've been talking about, these big challenges that we're facing as humanity, as our world, um, mm -hmm. sometimes, I, I, and you said about, you know, having a toddler, um, these patterns that we're trying to bait, break, um, you know, things that have been, the seeds that have been watered in our own lives before we had the choice to, or before we even realized that they were being watered. Mm. Do you ever at times struggle with maybe a choice you might make, you know, with, uh, you know, a reaction around uh, your son and, and something he is doing, but then feel, you know, there's so much going on in the world. Why are you getting bothered or frustrated or whatever with this small thing, like a mm. toddler mm. flipping their plate and throwing it on the floor, you know, like to mm -hmm. them, they're thinking, oh, I wonder what that sounds like when it hits the floor to right. us. It's just one more thing, but such a mm -hmm. minor thing that it shouldn't, shouldn't quote unquote bother mm. us. I'm kind of astonished to say, uh, complete and wholehearted no. <laughs> it's not that I don't react. I definitely do. And just this morning, I think it was, you know, uh, our, our, my son, I'm, I'm solo dad this week. My wife is away uh. at a conference and, uh, you know, it's day five. So <laughs> you yep. know what that's like. Yeah. Um, just this morning, he did something during breakfast along those lines of throwing something on the floor or trying to, you know, and, and I responded a little bit more quickly and intensely than I would have liked. I reacted yeah. and just said, said, no, you know, and it was like, mm -hmm. you don't need to do that. But yeah. there, I think it's through the, um, <sighs> The, challenge, the effect of my years of meditation practice, I, I don't judge myself for it. Mm. It just doesn't arise. There just isn't a sense of like, yeah, what you said of like, why am I getting so reactive when there's so it's like, yeah, of course I'm getting reactive because, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I'm tired and I'm slightly mm -hmm. stressed and mm -hmm. he won't do what I want. It's like <laughs> I have compassion for uh -huh. myself. Uh -huh. I have compassion for myself. What I do feel sometimes is not self-judgment or self-criticism as I do feel remorse. Mm. So um, this was more the case when he was younger and we were having sleepless nights yeah. and lots of crying at two in the morning. And, you know, um, uh, although it did just happen actually the other day where I would get angry, you mm. know, so just the other day he was, uh, resisting his nap, probably because he wasn't actually tired in <laughs> retrospect, yeah. you know, but I was getting frustrated. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I picked him up to rock him and he's got one binky in his mouth and two binkies in his hands. And I took <laughs> the binkies out of his hands to put them back in the crib. And I did it a little bit forcefully because I was frustrated and angry. Yeah. And I, f I felt so sad afterwards. I felt mm -hmm. so much remorse that I wasn't able to be more patient. I wasn't, I didn't judge myself. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, you know, how could you do that? Or when there's so much going, but I did feel this genuine pain in my heart of the impact. And I think that's healthy. That's how, uh, as humans, we learn from our actions is to feel the, mm. the hurt of regret when we do mm -hmm. something that we wish we hadn't done. We take in that pain and that provides a context for doing it differently next time. I have to say to me, not having the self judgment with that. And I have done that, you know, um, in, not that exact situation, but very similar many times and in, in my parenting and I have the remorse, I have that pain, mm. but there's definitely a whole lot of, uh, mm. like, why did you do that? You're so, mm. you know, you you know what, you know, you should be doing better, but mm. you're not, um, 
Mm. So I guess that's something for me to work toward and keep, mm-hmm. you know, using that compassion with for myself. all of us. And just to be clear, there are probably other areas in my life where I mm. where that it's not like I'm totally free of self criticism, mm. <laughs> but it doesn't come up with my son for some reason, at least not yet. And you know, it's something to work on, but it's also something to be compassionate towards ourselves about. You know, to recognize in that moment that not only mm. are you struggling, feeling remorse, but now you're suffering more mm. from the reactivity of the self-judgment. And so to, to turn towards that whenever we can with some compassion. And as we were talking about before, to break the cycle this in this uh, context of inner violence by empathizing with that voice, yeah. you know, by turning towards it and recognizing, hey, you're really trying to look out for me. You know, you really have high standards as a mm. mom. Isn't that beautiful? Thank you. Mm. Yeah, hearing the the... Going back to my first book on communication, you know, hearing the legitimate needs and values behind that critique. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, um, let's, I mean, I want to actually say, so say what you mean is, was your first book. Um, people, I will put link in the show notes to that, but your heart was, uh, made for this is, uh, your new book coming out, uh, very soon as, as you listen to this listeners. So go ahead and pre-order it. Any last words you want to share with the community? I just thank you for mm-hmm. listening, for taking the time to explore and engage and probably didn't agree with everything I said. And <laughs> I like that. That's good. You know, that's how we learn from one yeah. another. Um, and thank you for having me on the show, Tina. Yeah, as always, a pleasure, Oren. And uh, just, yeah, appreciate you and, and your vulnerability in sharing. I also encourage listeners to go follow Oren on uh, Instagram. Um, I definitely appreciate your videos when you share them Mm. out. I think it gives Mm. a lot of people, including myself, the permission to feel what we're feeling, whereas Mm. other other people haven't done it in such a genuine, empathetic, compassionate way. So, yeah, I appreciate Mm. you. Thank you. Before we go any further, I just want to give a quick shout out to the Running For Real team. Without them, I would not be able to do barely anything compared to what I'm able to do today. They are behind the scenes. They are there for me. I am just so appreciative of them. To Jeremy Nessel, our podcast editor, audio consultant, and someone who's been with me since the start. To Sally Pontarelli, our content and operations manager, who is there day to day doing all the things to help me be successful. To Kelsey Wang, our head of design, and Louise Murphy, our associate designer. And finally, to Sandy Gutierrez, our photographer and content strategist, I am appreciative of all of you and wouldn't be able to do what I do without you. Oh, that conversation was so needed. Oren is a beautiful example of someone who is just able to give love and compassion and in a way we all really need right now. So I encourage you to go check out his book, Uh, There will be links to it in the show notes. You can go to runningforreal.com forward slash episode 376. Also to check out our partners for today, that is Precision to go get your gels and electrolytes uh, by using code Tina sent me. You can get 15% off. Tracksmith, you can get that 15 off $75 or more if you're a new customer by using code Tina new. And AG1, you can get that one year free supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 plus five free travel packs. Again, all those links will be at runningforreal.com forward slash episode 376. May I remind you, if you have not left a review for Becoming a Sustainable Runner yet, I would really appreciate it if you could go do that. Again, links in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening. I will have a special episode for you next week sharing about... Uh, what it was like to run the New York City Marathon with Kayleigh Williamson to be swirling in this viral moment that is currently happening and something else that I cannot tell you now, but you will see in the next few days, a ginormous opportunity and uh, stay tuned. It's going to be here soon. Thanks so much for listening. I'll see you next week.